everyone, and welcome back. Today I am joined by my living pillow, Bailey, to talk about yet another research rabbit hole, because that seems to be the way that I do most of my research lately. This particular one started when I was trying to understand what sort of structures would have been worn underneath my evening gown that I'm making from around late 1898, early 1899. It's a very distinct era in fashion, and fashion is changing fairly rapidly. Now, this particular bodice that I'm reproducing was produced in England, though the company does state that they do French styles for a lot of the things that they sell there. So I'm looking at French styles, English styles, and American styles for this silhouette. And obviously different regions of the world are going to have different styles, but I'm focusing in on the articles that I can find from England and from America in particular, because Americans really liked writing about fashion a lot. And interestingly enough, I found a lot more than I expected. The fashions that were changing during this time were changing much more abruptly and much more extremely than I expected. And apparently more so than they expected during that time period as well, because they got rather flustered over the changes in figure and more specifically the changes in the shape of women's hips during this period from around 1896 to around 1906. That was what I was specifically trying to do research in, though I found that really most of it centered in around 1897 to 1899. And oh boy, did things get um, interesting and controversial in ways that I honestly did not expect. But before we get into that, I want to give a big thank you to the sponsor for this week's video, Magellan TV. Magellan TV has a massive library of documentaries with a seemingly unending variety of interesting topics. I personally am pretty obsessed with the history of transportation and how it impacted the world of trade and fashion. So I was excited to find Europe's famous railway stations added to the list. I expected to learn about the history and architecture of these grand buildings, but it was so much more. They brought the stations to life through the stories of their construction, interviews with people who work with the historical objects today, and in-depth views of what the experience would have been like for people traveling through at the height of the railroad age. These buildings impacted the city and world around them, not just making travel an everyday part of our lives, but providing places for people to work, shop, eat, and even live. At the turn of the 20th century, fashion was changing rapidly, and it had to in order to keep up with the world around it. Railways and other stations were at the heart of this momentous change, and this show expressed that vibrant history beautifully. It's shows like this that keep me coming back to Magellan TV over and over. Over. They have over 3,000 videos on ancient and modern history, biographies, science, and so much more. There are new videos added every week, so go check it out now. Click the link below to get your first month free, and you'll be discovering all that Magellan TV has to offer instantly. And thanks again to Magellan TV for sponsoring this week's video. Before we get into all the controversy, though, let's start back at the beginning. Let's go back to 1895, before the hips got big. In 1895, instead of the hips, it was the sleeves and the hem of the skirt that were oversized. The sleeves were absolutely immense. This was the biggest point that they had reached in the 1890s, and the hem of the skirt was incredibly wide. Some things said up to seven yards wide, which is just massive. They were stiffening out these skirts, sometimes even interlining them completely in hair cloth. So they were incredibly stiff, rigid, fell away from the waist, very straight lines. And you don't really see an accentuation of the hips at all because that would be lost in all of this. The waist already looks tinier than it actually is because there's so much volume on top and so much volume on bottom. So you don't need to do anything to make the waist look smaller than it already appears. However, this starts to change in 1896. Some of the references that I found came up with different reasons as to why this started to change, but the general consensus was sleeves were deflating because if they get that big, they have nowhere else to go but down, and the hem was deflating because the same sort of thing. It can only get so large before you have to start building all sorts of crazy understructures underneath of it. And so instead of doing cage crinolines again, they decided to start deflating and destructuring the skirt, deflating and destructuring those sleeves. And once that started to happen, they were looking for another point of emphasis. And it wasn't just an automatic, oh, we're gonna go to the hips. It actually occurred because of the small fashion changes that were happening at the time. One of the things that was specifically noted was that Basque waists were in. This is this little peplum ruffle that's occurring right at the waist area, and that sticks out over the hips. In order to get that to stick out horizontally like it 
is supposed to visually, it helps to sort of pad that area out a little bit, have an abrupt padding from the waist to the hips. On top of this, as this skirt is deflating and destructuring, there needs to be something to hold it out appropriately. There's less and less skirt to hold out. They don't need that much structure as they did before, but a little bit of hip padding, as they stated, could hold out the skirts as well as all of that structure did, but do better with a slightly smaller skirt. So the skirts are now deflating from, say, seven yards down to maybe five yards in width down at the bottom. And this hip pad comes in to support the skirt, support the basque, and sort of help balance out the figure as the sleeve styles and other things are changing and shifting, because it continues to make the waist look smaller than it actually is, but without having to build out all this other stuff that's going away. They also note at this time that it's more than just hip pads, it's also technically the bustle returning. And I use that term loosely like they did because they aren't referring to the bustle of the 1880s. They're talking about any sort of padding over the butt. And for them, it's really just small cushions, small pads, things that fill out that space. They specify that crescent-shaped bustles are what's coming in. And that's kind of what we tend to really iconically think of in the late Victorian and early Edwardian period as padding out that area of the body are these crescent-shaped things that, you know, vary in size and shape a little bit, but it's the vague concept of it. By 1897, they are pushing this even further. The body shape is starting to change. They're mentioning that corsets are no longer curvy over the front. They don't come out at the bust, in at the waist, and back out at the stomach. Instead, they are moving to a straight front. This straight front includes a very low bust, which is one of the reasons why we do start to see the bust level. Of course, it's drop pretty dramatically during this era to what seems like barely at bust level. And they define the hips as being springy. Obviously, the Basque waist helped bring in different bustle and hip paddings, but the next really fashionable gown style that brought about even more changes in the silhouette is the princess gown. And they mentioned that the princess cut gown, which has absolutely no waistline, it just skims tightly over the figure, down over the hips and waist, is something that really needs the perfect figure underneath. And women were finding that they didn't have that exact figure in order to get this straight front that was coming in or to get that curve over the hips. They needed to sometimes pad out their hips to get the right shape, otherwise the gown just didn't look right. So bustles and hip pads are becoming more and more popular, more and more common. One article that I found said that you can see this not only in the stores, but also on the streets as nine out of every 10 women that you meet seem to have some sort of padding in that area. And immediately it becomes apparent that not Everyone is fond of this new figure. One very lengthy article that I found went into great detail and great verbiage about how much they do not like this new silhouette that women are adopting. They say that the new shape is a burlesque of everything that is womanly, pretty, and in conformity with the laws of common sense. That the new shapes are essentially pulling in the waist too tight and jutting out at the hips at an angle that's just absolutely unnatural. They even called it a meat sack tied in the middle, and basically said that it is bad medically, in terms of attractiveness, and in terms of ethics. Which is a lot to attribute to some basic padding. And this is the point where I start to find the references that really surprised me. This particular quote was the first one that I came across that sent me really down this rabbit hole to understand what exactly was so controversial about these hips. This article states, It is a weak attempt to ape mannishness. A woman who cultivates the new figure is not a woman. I don't know about you, but I do not immediately equate hips with mannishness. And this is a term that they regularly use during this era instead of terms like manly or masculine. Mannishness is kind of the catch term of that particular era. So this person is saying hips are manly? Okay, I need to look into this a little bit further, keep reading. What they are comparing these hips to are the statues of the ancient Greek era, looking at Hercules and other gods and heroic figures that have absolutely muscular thighs. And the author is saying that women are trying to imitate these Greek gods, essentially, with giant muscular overbuilt 
thighs. Specifically, he states, the prominent hip, muscularly prominent, is the attribute of male strength and is therefore social barbarism when cultivated by women. Which is a very strong concept when in reality what he's picturing is just women who clearly never skipped leg day. And this really just changed my perspective on the hip because though there are definitely eras where the hip for women is accentuated prior to the late 19th century, we're talking about the side hoops of the 18th century that are not meant to resemble natural figures. They're very much an extension of the skirt. They're to show off the fabric, show off the trimming. They are not meant to convince someone that that is their body underneath. Whereas these hip pads are accentuating the body, but to apparently a rather comical degree. So it's trying to be natural in its shape, but not exactly natural in its size. So this presents a very interesting concept that this person at least viewed them as masculine and muscular. And on top of that, he says that not only is that the major problem, but also that they are too angular. And that's what makes them really look not correct on a whole nother level, that they are no longer looking strong and muscular by having this sharp angle from the waist to the hips jutting out, but instead they look fragile, like they could break in the middle because no strong human being is angular. And he actually specifies there are no angular blacksmiths. Which I suppose is true in certain ways, but the fact that he trends both ways, that hips are too masculine and muscular, but they are also making these women look weak and fragile, and it's just, it's a whole big mess of craziness. And I thought perhaps maybe, just maybe this was the only person that thought this way, because that definitely happens. There are definitely controversial subjects like fashion that one person finds to be an absolute travesty, but no, it it wasn't just this person, and this became a point of argument, supporting and against hip pads. The only particular reasoning that this particular person came up with as to why hip pads could be good is the fact that they seem to have led to lighter weight skirts. Skirts had now reduced from, say, five yards to three and a half yards around the bottom. They were no longer nearly as heavy and structured, and that allowed for better and easier movement, because they do specify in the article that the movement of American women is just absolutely horrible. They move in all sorts of strange ways and can't walk normally because of all of the structure and all of the things built around them, which is where the medical issues seem to come from, that putting padding around that section of your body is unhealthy and doesn't allow you to move and function correctly, doesn't allow your body to breathe correctly, all of those things. So they really come up with all of the things that could be wrong with these hip pads, with the exception of they've allowed for lighter weight skirts. Now, obviously these satires and other dramatic reactions to hip padding weren't the only things out there. There were plenty of references in fashionable magazines talking about padded hips being in, talking about the sort of padding that you should use, how to keep it looking natural, how to keep it healthy, that you shouldn't use hair padding unless you live in a very cold climate because it does keep you very warm, that cotton padding is far too heavy, that the canvas ruffles and crinoline ruffles Ruffles, things were just too bulky and very often just unnatural looking in their appearance. And instead, what you should go with is something that is supported by feather bone. That, of course, produces a very lightweight, breathable structure. And though this particular article did not mention the wire bustles and hip pads that come out during this era, those may have been just after this article. And they're a great example of something that would be lightweight, very breathable, and could be formed and shaped to be fairly natural, in theory, on the body. The same article does mention that you need to make absolutely sure that one, your corset is appropriately shaped in order to adapt and function with these things, and that they need to be properly secured. Because as one satire I came across mentioned, that was apparently an issue. These large hip pads slipping their cables 
as he put it, and creating a rather uh, turbulent appearance as the woman walked down the street, seemingly like these pads are made out of horsehair or even possibly pneumatic as they bounce to and fro. And the caricature is not only of this, but of a woman who then consequently falls over. And because of these massive pads on the side that are so bouncy, apparently, she just bounces down the street unendingly like a rubber ball. <laughs> Though they do admit that the benefit could be if you make them large enough, you might be able to store some things on the side as you go shopping. So clearly there are plenty of people that find this comical, find it dangerous, find it unattractive. This is not just a one-off situation. And I found a few other references as I went as well. One in 1899 specifying that men were not so foolish as to possibly believe that these are women's actual bodies. Why are women doing this? They actually say that the chief duties and pleasures of women are to make themselves attractive to men. So why are they doing this thing when men can tell that it's not correct and men don't find it attractive? And again, don't possibly think about the fact that women are doing this for other women in fashion. But the point is, it seems to be a controversy, which is terribly interesting considering that this actually only lasted a very, very brief moment. We only really start to see the comical nature of the size of hip pads come in right at the end of 1897, beginning of 1898. So I was finding all those references in fashion magazines to larger and larger hip pads, all of the references to the satire of larger and larger hip pads and bustles. And by the time you reach mid-1899, things start to shift. Tight-hipped skirts are in. In fact, one particular style was called an eelskin skirt. They really are looking for tighter and tighter skirts, less and less fullness around the hip area, less and less fullness around the base, and these skirts are getting lighter weight, more diaphanous, and clinging to the hips. So oversized hip pads are becoming really obvious and really out of place. The new figure really pushes for a completely flat front, and the rest of the figure starts to follow. In order to get that flat front, the padding has now moved to being actually right in the chest area. So that way, just in case the woman does not have a completely flat stomach and there's a gap between the belly and the bust, they fill that out with padding. Sometimes apparently a little heart shape is quite popular for that area. And the rest of the figure is sort of strapped in. Sometimes they use webbing in order to reduce the bust to help with that front line. Sometimes they use webbing around the hips in order to pull the hips in and start to flatten and shape those out. So the corsets and the hip shapes and the overall silhouette are changing dramatically during 1899. One article that I found in September of 1899 specifies that while hip pads are still being sold, they are completely absent from Parisian fashion and women in America should not be buying and wearing them any longer unless they want to be out of fashion. And interestingly enough, it's a very abrupt hit in terms of the references that I found because once I got to the end of 1899 and they stopped talking about how hip pads are out, no one's wearing hips, slim hips are in, no one talks about them again for a good long while. In fact, I didn't really find many references in 1900 or 1901. And that's not to say that there aren't still items being sold like that. It's just that they aren't the big fashionable thing that everyone's talking about. And in fact, when I see the mention of hip pads come up again in 1902, it was, again, not what I expected to be seeing as a reference. Instead of talking about women's hips coming back or women's hips going away, they were talking about fashionable men patting out their hips. That's right, I found quite a few references and one particular article that got reprinted and reprinted and reprinted all over different newspapers all over the United States that was talking about how fashionable men were starting to wear one to two inch thick hip pads on the side because their fashion was also changing. Their coats previously had been somewhat oversized and loose, falling away from the shoulders. But now they were starting to tighten up. The back was fitting to the back and men were finding that as they were wearing more and more fitted coats, they weren't getting the shape that they were looking for. Going back and thinking about that mannish hip of 1898, it makes a little bit more sense that men were padding out their hips in order to get a better, more muscular, more built up figure. They were saying they were already wearing some slight padding in their shoulders, so what difference does it make if they pad out another part of their body? Now, 
these coats, these pants aren't as tight as say 10, 20 years later. So it's not as obvious in the fashion plates or the images that I could find. But the claim is that it wasn't meant to be dramatic. It was meant to hold the coat appropriately and get the right curve and was meant to just make it look like they had a good amount of muscle on the side because Taylor's manuals of the time do talk about how to adjust the drafting patterns for flat hips or for full hips. So clearly they were looking for something in the middle that would be the fashionable appropriate style. And not surprisingly, this was considered somewhat controversial as well because in the mind of many of the people that were writing about it, this really was a very vain thing to do. And I even came across a couple of poems talking about the vanity of men and patting out their shoulders and patting out their hips and just generally all of the structure and even coarse sits and things like that they were wearing in order to get the appropriate fashionable figure. So they weren't just talking down on women doing this sort of thing, they were doing it to men too. But despite this honestly very, very brief explosion of men patting their hips, which I could only find references to in 1902, by 1903 we're back to seeing references to women patting out their hips in natural ways. They specify that hip padding is not fashionable and it will be quite a long while before it is again. However, padding out the hips where you have deficiencies, padding out the figure where you have unevenness, that makes sense. That is practical to do. Though there are still corsets that lace in with tight webbing and other styles, the hips to get the flat, smooth hip line that is so apparently desired in French fashion, there are still plenty of patents coming out around this time. There are plenty of advertisements. There are plenty of other references that show that hip padding was still around. That these small bustles and other structures were still around. And if you look at corsets of this era, which are pretty distinct in their overall shape, so we can date those really obviously to the 1900s, that they have very accentuated hips still. So obviously not all women are necessarily going to fill out that space. Not all women are going to have the figure that is appropriate for that particular type of corset. And they're going to still go through padding out the figure in small ways. In fact, one of the patents that I came across, which is what I ended up using, was from 1901. And it combined the hip pad, the crescent shape in whatever style that you personally wanted and had a sort of curtain that went over the top that was boned. And so that would help lift out the skirts further away from the body, would help smooth out over that cushion. It could be used underneath or over a corset depending on the style. So it could help hold the skirts out and it could be whatever shape or size that the person particularly needed. So that's a rather ingenious style and I did find advertisements for similar ones around the same era. That's one of the reasons why I personally went with making that style because it seemed really practical and usable in lots of ways and honestly I could adjust it fairly easily to fit my body or figure shape that I needed. And women seemed to be thinking the same way that I was. That they didn't necessarily need massive changes, they just needed slight structure. One very popular woman who was speaking on this matter was Mademoiselle Wade. And she would go around showing in these fashion shows how padding could help women, but in small natural ways. And so she would have models who were fully masked to hide their identity come out and stand in a room full of women to show them how a little padding over the shoulder or on the back or the bust or the hip would even out the figure and give it the correct proportions and correct shape. That if someone was uneven, you could correct that. And she stated, tailors do the same thing for men. Why should women not do this? Tailors will pad out the chest and the shoulders, and that's considered acceptable. In order to pad out a deficient figure, as they called it, or to even up the figure, padding was expected and normal. But this didn't mean that they were going back to the oversized padded out, straightly angled hip. In reality, that never really came Back. The subtle hip of the 1900s, which to our eye is still very large, was really there to help accentuate the tininess of the waist and to help hold out the skirts correctly. And was meant to be padded, at least according to all of the articles that I could find, fairly naturally, which 
was not what I was really expecting. I thought the height of the hip, as it were, was more around the mid-1900s with what we term today an S-bend corset. Historically, they referred to it as a straight front style of corset, and there were variations on that in terms of the height of the hips, depending on what sort of hip control or shaping was needed, in terms of the bust control, and obviously, the overall shape starts to shift again, which I have talked about previously in my video about the birth of the brassiere and the death of the corset, which wasn't truly the death, but looking at the figure changes that occur from around 1910 and forward. And this figure change is really the thing that leads up to it, moving away from over padding and over curving and over structure towards a very slim, sleek figure where the fabric is actually holding very tight to the body in many places around the hips, which was not so typical for most of the eras. That was a fairly new thing in many ways. And so it was this gradual change in fashion in terms of the, the overall silhouette and the structure and the size of the skirt and all these things that were shifting. But thankfully for me, it gave me the answer that I was looking for. And the fact that my evening gown that I'm reproducing is likely from all of the research I've done on that somewhere around late 1898, early 1899. Hips were still big during that time. They hadn't deflated yet. And though this particular gown was made in England and they will inevitably have some slightly different dates as to when their fashions were picking up and dropping off on these things. From what I can find, they too were experiencing oversized hips during this era. So having a relatively good sized hip is necessary for that style that I'm going to be reproducing. On top of that, it also helps me know that the straight front line corset that I have that I thought was only really going to be appropriate from 1903 and later actually is probably fairly appropriate. Though many of the corset images I could find from around 1899 are a little bit shorter in the hips and a little bit higher in the bust, it's not a dramatic difference. And I would be far better suited with that style than with my earlier 1890s curvy front style that has a curved spoon busk and would be probably better off considering my figure with something that does help support and hold the bust in place rather than the under bust style of ribbon corsets that I have. So after back and forth and back and forth between all the different corsets, I settled on that straight front style with a fair amount of hip padding holding out the portions underneath, and perhaps I will even add some padding on top because it likely does fit in that winter of 98 to 99. And well, hips were apparently at the point where they were causing quite a controversy. Ward McAllister, Barry Wall, Beau Brummel, and Walder Kirk. We beg of you, tell us one and all what feverish fancies lurk within your brains of men who are laced as tight as lightly abroad they trip. Oh, what do you think of the male wasp waist and what of the padded hip? Oh, Emperor William and Edward Rex, gentlemen both, I ween, what do you think as you crane your necks gazing upon such a scene? Tell us you both adore the fad sartorially in its place. What do you think of the men who pad and what of the men who lace? Trousers padded at the hips, the style is bound to come. Tailors say so. Must squeeze our waist with corsets till our ribs warp out of plum. Got to do it. Must try to catch the curvings of the female form divine. Must imitate the girlies in their every graceful line. Each man must be an hourglass built round a suffering spine. Lord save us. In studying our fashion plates, the girlies we will ape. Won't we? Bet we will. We'll rub her neck on streets to see the other fellow's shape. Size him up plenty. Before our mirrors we must stand, oh what a funny fate, while dressing to before the world in pride perambulate. To satisfy ourselves that we have got our hips on straight, wouldn't it kill you? The girls will stick hat pins in us in every public place, or they'll want to know, you know, to see if we are genuine or imitation space. They'll have their suspicions. They'll walk behind us on the streets wherever we may go, and will dissect us metaphor in whispers soft and low, and giggle when they really should admire us, don't you know? That's honest. There's really no escape for us. The fashion's on the way. No chance to run. It's liable to reach us now most any fateful day. Oh, the thought of it. The women imitate us in their vests and ties and shirts, some of them even wear the pants the married man asserts. And old king fashion yet may drape our underpins and skirts. Toot Gabriel toot. <laughs> 